Hello and welcome to the latest webinar from the European Social Survey, City University of London and National Centre for Social Research series. Today's speaker is Ignacio Vega, who's going to be talking about the reliability of self-reported measures of sexual behaviour. Before I hand over to Ignacio, just to say he will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which time there will be some space for questions. If you'd like to leave a question for Ignacio, you can do so at any time throughout the webinar by using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, I'm Eric Harrison, a Deputy Director at ESS Headquarters, and I'm chairing today's webinar. So without further ado, I give the floor to Ignacio. Uh, well, hello everyone. As Eric just clearly mentioned uh, a couple of minutes, uh, seconds ago, my name is Ignacio Franco Vega, and I'm going to present a paper that I've been working on. It's called What's the Point of Asking? A Review of the Reliability of Self-Reported Measures of Sexual Behavior. Uh, however, this paper has changed a bit since its creation. We are going to focus only on condomless sexual behavior. Sorry about that. Uh, now, let's go. Now, uh, a bit of a trigger warning before we start. This um, presentation is going to talk about uh, sex. And this is not the classic demographic sex, like men, female, etc. We are talking about proper sex, the sort of sex that involves penises, vaginas, and other things. So, of course, we are going to end up discussing uh, topics regarding semen and many other fluids. So I just want you all to be aware that we are going to talk about those topics today. Having said that, let's start the presentation. So this is a map that I became very interested in. I don't know if any of you know what this map represents, but this is a map of the reported penis size around the world. Now, before you start looking for your country of interest, I can tell you that the country with the largest average penis is the broader nation of Ecuador, just north of Peru here. And... I asked an Ecuadorian friend when I learned about this fact, uh, what did you thought about what did you thought about this metric? And after collecting her thoughts, she told me, you know what? This proves that Ecuador is full of liars. And this, of course, is not true. The world is full of liars, and that is what we are going to discuss today. So before we do that, let's the first thing that we need to do is make sure we are all on the same page regarding reliability. Reliability is the overall consistency of a measure. This is what we call reliability in statistics or psychometry. In, uh, in other words, if I use an instrument to measure something, it should give me the same results more than once, unless something has changed, of course. For example, if I measure the length of, let's say, this screwdriver, uh, if I measure it with the same ruler, I should get the same response, uh, the same metric when I measure it twice. However, if I measure the width of it, like this part, it is not going to provide, a it might provide a reliable results, but not a valid results. And that has to do with the difference between reliability and validity. They are not the same. They are distinct but related concepts. Validity means that the measurement, the measuring, the measurements that you are measuring measure what you are supposed to measure. And I think that is kind of a, a mouthful, but it's important that we like that we try to understand this since we are talking about these issues. Now um, an example could be useful to better understand this. So let's say that we have three archers. The first archer is a terrible archer. His shots are all over the place. He is both inconsistent, uh, that means unreliable and invalid. We have a second archer, which is better. Her shots are tightly grouped, but they are still off the bullseye. So she is reliable, but invalid. And the third archer is the best archer. Her shots are tightly grouped around the center of the target, which means that she is both reliable and valid. I, think, I hope that this example helped to understand a bit more about the difference between reliability and validity. Now, what are the usual threats to reliability? Uh, in the case of sexual behavior, one of the main ones, if not the most important one, is social desirability. 
Social desirability is the tendency to give socially desirable answers instead of choosing those that are closer to the respondent's behavior, thoughts, and feelings. And this is heavily affected by contextual cues of a strong that, for example, when you are reporting, so, sorry, social contextual clues. So for example, if you are reporting to a high authority figure, or if you are participating on an intervention and they are telling you to do something uh, regarding your sexual behavior, you are going to be more easily influenced by social desirability. Uh, in the case of recall errors, we also have the problem that people aren't always able to remember an event or a decision that happened long ago. And finally, inadequate phrasing of, of questions and answers. Depending on how you present a question, the, repo the respondent might not be able to properly register their answer or will cherry pick one to make it look as if he is more uh, responsible than what he actually, he or she is actually is. Besides these three that I just mentioned, there are several other issues to reliability regarding social research and sexual behavior in general. And an example could make things easier to understand. Uh, so here is an excerpt of the DHS of 2018 of Peru. Depending on how good your Spanish is, you can probably figure out how this is filled. In summary, the respondent needs to answer, among other things, which specific contraceptive method they use each month for the past five years. Now, this is not easy to do. As you can probably imagine, social desirability is going to have an effect. Contraceptive use is a responsible action, and some people might want to be seen as a responsible person, so they might over-report their contraceptive use. There might be recall errors because memory is not perfect, and it's especially hard to remember if one used the specific contraceptive in January of 2017 or 18, who knows how many years ago. And this is particularly true for non-permanent methods, such as condom use and also inadequate phrasing. So in this case, the, st the structure of the response does not allow people to, to answer accurately if they have used more than one method at the same time, or more importantly, if they use different methods with different partners at the same time. So this forces the respondent to make an answer, but that answer is not particularly standardized. It's going to depend on the specific person's criteria, and that might create some issues. No. How do we assess the reliability of self-reported measures of condom use? Usually we have a few methods. The first one is the intermethod reliability. Here, we measure the same event in two different ways. The most common one that is used here is biomark are biomarkers. So you contrast the self-reports of condom use to biomarkers of semen exposure. This is seen commonly as the gold standard, like the best measure that exists, the most accurate, the most reliable. Uh, another one is inter-rate reliability. And here we have the fact that two examiners or two witnesses report on the same event. And in the case of sexual behavior, the most common one is couples reports. So you ask one member of the sexual couple and then another member of the sexual couple, and then you contrast the responses to see if they are consistent. Finally, you have test retest reliability, which has to do with measuring the same event twice. So for example, the most common method here are diary studies. In this case, you have one person to keep a sexual diary in which they have to write or report uh, every sexual event or every day, at the end of every day, how many sexual events, if they used a condom or not, what sort of sexual activity they engage with whom, et cetera. And you contrast those daily reports to aggregated weekly, biweekly, monthly, reports and you compare and contrast if to keep to see if they are consistent or not. These are all very interesting. However, they are also very complex. So we can only focus on one today and that one is going to be intermethod reliability. So I'm sorry if you were looking forward to the other two. Uh, we might discuss them in the future at our point, but if you have a specific question, please let me know. Now, let's go to biomarkers of unprotected sex then. Uh, now, what is a biomarker? A biomarker is a biological indicator of a state or condition. So for example, blood pressure, resting heart rate, level of triglycerides, blood glucose, those sorts of indicators are biomarkers, biological indicators. In the case of semen exposure, there are several indicators and I have divided them into three tiers. 
what I call the bad indicators, for example, STI status, what I call the mediocre indicators, such as sperm, and I, what I call the decent enough indicators, which are three, simnogilin, prostate-specific antigen, which from now on I will call PSA, and Y-chromosomal DNA. In this case, we are going to focus on these indicators, especially prostate, specifically prostate-specific antigen, PSA, and Y-chromosomal DNA. Now, what is the method that I use to assess the reliability of these measures? I did what I called a systematic issue review. In this case, I, my objective was to systematize the assessment of reliability of self-reported measures compared against a biomarker of semen exposure. Oh, by the way, I call it systematic -ish because usually systematic review is done by a team of people and I did this on my own. So yeah, uh, I'm still looking for a, uh, an academic partner, by the way, if you're interested in this. Uh, in any case, this is my objective. And the databases that I searched through were these four, Signet and Base Medline and Scopus. I devise a search strategy. It requires some adjustments of my, on my attempt attempt. After removing rats and cancer and adding semen, I got the search strategy right. And I found a total of 2,000 and a bit more results. After removing duplicates, I got 1,400. After the title and abstract screening, I was down to 93. After the full text screening, I was down to 40. And out of those 40, I think I have more or less 33 studies. I say more or less because the thing is that researchers here sometimes recycle some of the samples that they are using to test the to, to assess the reliability. So I'm not completely sure that I have 40 studies. I believe I have 33. Now, during a systematic review, you find a lot of strange stuff, and I like to keep track of it because it always makes me happy to share it. So for example, I found some stuff that had to do with camel semen collection, which is something I never imagined was going to be published. Another one that is called vasectomy tips and tricks, which was great. And the last one is the prostate laser vaporization in men with urinary retention. And in this case, I'm sorry, I imagine the urology something like this. Uh, but in fact, this is a very interesting and fascinating surgical procedure to help people with under enlarged prostates. So if you're interested, find a couple of YouTube videos and they will show you how it works. In any case, what were my results? So, most studies share a typical methodology, a, a common methodology that is that I'm going to divide in three stages. The first one is recruitment. And here they try to recruit as many as many participants as possible. They are all participating voluntarily and they provide a very detailed informed consent on what the study is going to consist of. The second stage is the data collection, and this has two methods. One of them is the interview or survey. Here, the respondents have to answer about their sexual behavior in the past X number of days, depending on the biomarkers that the researchers are using. And the sort of questions that, is, that are asked here are very encounter-specific, concrete questions. So they ask things about, OK, did you have sex? What sort of activities did you have? When did you did you use a condom? When did you start wearing it? At some point, it broke. You take you took it off. Someone took it off. Whatever it failed. It's very concrete. It's very specific. And the other type, or sorry, the other stage. It's not a stage. The other data collection method that they are using is the biological sampling. And in this case, it consists of a vaginal swab. Uh, so the uh, uh, health specialist swaps the inside of the vagina of the respondents, the, in all of the cases they were women, and they test for the presence of biomarkers of semen exposure. And once they have these two, the interview, the self-reported measure, and the biomarkers, they contrast the results. In the case of PSA, the window that they usually use is 48 hours, and in the case of Y-chromosomal DNA, is 14 days. So they ask for the past 14 days of sexual behavior or the past 48 hours of sexual behavior. Now, after having, after knowing this shared methodology, let's go through the year of publication. This is a relatively stable outcome. Neither PSA nor Y chromosomal DNA are recent discoveries. So they have been researched in the past 30 years. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, 
uh, studies frequently use preserved sample, like refrigerated samples. So you can go back several years. So you can publish a study in 2023 with samples that were taken 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So that's important to remember. Another thing that it's important for context is the location of the sample. So most of the samples, uh, most of the studies are carried out with samples that come from Sub-Saharan Africa. However, we also have several studies from all over the world. So we have studies from the US, some in Jamaica, China, India, Italy, etc. So this is kind of like a well-distributed uh, population, but the majority of the studies are uh, concentrated on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and the characteristics of the population are also important to consider. So the majority of the studies are there, they deal with heterosexual adults. A few, just one of them, I'm sorry, deals with heterosexual teenagers and another large group deals with female sex workers. Curiously enough, there, is, there are no studies with men who have sex with men, which is a group that is usually included in these sorts of studies given he, their a um, higher risk of suffering from STIs. However, none of the studies in, included men who have sex with men. The health status of the participants was also varying. Some studies were with people that have no STIs, around half of them, but the other half dealt with people that had one or more STIs diagnosis. And the most common STIs diagnosis that was worked in these studies was of course HIV. And that is also related to the fact that most of the, the studies were done in South Africa, I'm sorry, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, another important thing that we should discuss is the fact that there are, that a big percentage of the studies were done among an intervention a, a policy intervention, a health interventions, and this sort of intervention could be trying to increase contraceptive use, could be distributing PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, or some longitudinal studies. And this is, a, of course, this is important because they were working with people who were suffering from STIs, but also you have to remember that social desirability might be affected by uh, the number of, uh, I'm sorry, by the fact that they're participating on a on an intervention and that they are reporting the information to a high status person, a person with high authority. Now, uh, the reliability, which is the most important part of this study, I'm sorry, of this in a presentation, uh, there are two ways of measuring. I'm using the native measure that the studies use, and I'm going to present to reliability, reliability A and reliability B. Now, uh, I was going to ask you to fill a survey, but I forgot to remember to remind Stefan to do it. So don't worry. Uh, however, I want you to think, what do you think is going to be the percentage of reports of abstinence that still got some uh, with a positive response of biomarkers of semen exposure. That means out of all the people who said that they did not have sex in the past 48 hours or 14 days, how many had a positive response, a, a positive um, test in their essay of semen exposure? Now, the number is larger than you would probably hope. Uh, we are looking, depending on the study, there's high variability, but we are looking at numbers that range in the lowest end, 8% of overreport, and the largest end of 65, 64% of condom overreport, uh, condom use overreport, and this is not good. Uh, in fact, this is bad. There are no particular differences between PSA and Y chromosomal DNA, so the biomarker doesn't seem to be having much of an effect, but there is still a high variability which might be related to the sampling procedure or the population that they're working with. In any case, we have a very large overreporting of condom use. If we test reliability B, which is similar but slightly different, we here we have the percentage of positive biomarker semen exposure that's, that means the ones that had a positive result on their biomarker test that also reported not having sex or 100% um, condom use in the past, however, X number of days. And here, the numbers are also high. They are, in a way, they are also high. They're indeed higher than before. So we have 
uh, scores that range from 18% to 70%, which is also bad. So if we follow this logic, this would imply as a conclusion that self-reported measures of condom use are consistently unreliable, which means we should not be using them, right? However, that only works if we consider that biomarkers are the gold standard, and then we have to ask ourselves if they are really the gold standard. And that is when we go down the rabbit hole, and this is a topic that I'm not really prepared to guide you through, but I'm still going to do my best uh, for us to try to understand how biomarkers work and what are their failings are, and strengths. So are biomarkers the gold standard? We need to approach this with a critical uh, method. So are they really objective? And if you want to go deeper, what is objectivity in reality? Like, does it even exist? How accurate are they? What's like, what's the sort of issues, the sort of measuring errors that they might have? And are people really misreporting that much? Because we have seen numbers that are like 60, 40, 50% of people. And these people know that they are going to be tested because they saw it in their informed consent or they were explained. So these are people that are misreporting, even though they know that they are going to be tested with biological markers. Uh, it's weird. I think we need to know more. Now, after reviewing a few critiques of biomarkers reliability, I have divided them in either issues that could increase the odds of false positives and issues that could increase the odds of false negatives. The first one, the false positive, the ones that we are going to focus on is the endogenous presence of PSA in women, the non-standardized threshold for a positive result, and the confounding effects that spermicides and lubricants and digital and oral sex might have in biomarker uh, data collection. And the case of the false negative, there are four things that could increase the odds of false negative, but we're only going to focus on the rate of biomarker decay. However, if you're interested in the other three, the use of all frozen sample, the sub techniques and materials, and the similar hyperviscosity, I can answer those questions as well. So let's try to focus on the false positives now. I don't know why I really love this picture of the condoms asking what, I, uh, so I'm going to use it more than once in this presentation, I'm sorry. So false positives, some preliminary concepts that we need to address before we, <clears throat> we go through this. The first one is detection threshold. Uh, detection, detection threshold is the smallest concentration of a biomarker that can be detected. And this is going to be affected by the sort of tool that you are using, using to try to pick up that biomarker. Uh, some tests are going to be more sensitive than others, in, another, in, in other words. And the other one is the positivity threshold, and this one is probably the most important one. This is the minimum concentration of a biomarker to be considered a positive result. In other ways, when we measure something, there's always going to be the possibility that some of it, some of whatever we are measuring, it's present in anything. However, there comes a point in which the present is large enough for us to go from zero to one, right? From negative to positive. That is the positivity threshold, the moment in which, in which we make the decision. And then we have to ask ourselves, what is PSA and where do we find it? PSA, it's a glycoprotein that is secreted in the epithelial cell by the epithelial cells of the prostate. Where is the prostate? You might be wondering. The prostate is there, as this lovely person is pointing. Uh, it's a donut-like structure that surrounds the urethra. Uh, and where do we find PSA then? PSA can be found at different quantities in seminal fluid, in breast milk, and in blood. However, since we are not going to find breast milk in a vagina, and the concentrations of blood are way below the positivity to the threshold used by most of the studies, that means that if we find PSA, if we have a positive response on the PSA uh, by swabbing the inside of a woman's vagina, that means that the presence of PSA is caused by external, external 
the external presence of con of semen, right? It's it's done it's done because we expose that because that vagina was exposed to semen at some point in time. That is the explanation, right? However, the problem is that it's not that simple because we have to do something about the one of the highest mysteries in science, apparently, which is female anatomy. Because the fact is that even though right now this is a debated topic, some urologists consider that women also have prostates that are able to produce prostate-specific antigen. This is... Um, a scan of a woman's female reproductive uh, organs. Here you can find the bladder. This is the urethra. And in this, I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a gray thingy over here. That could be a female prostate. This is the vagina, by the way. Um, but this is a debated topic. And um, Urologists are not really sure if this exists, if everyone has it. I'm sorry, if, if every woman has it, if the if the prostate that exists is enough, it's like active enough to create enough prostate-specific antigen uh, during female ejaculation or not, and if that enough to trigger the response or not, people don't really know. Um, uh, so one of the things that it's important here is that the presence of PSA in women. Uh, the presence of endogenous PSA in women, it's important, it's it's a thing that needs to be measured because it might create false positives, right? Because we are getting a high PSA enough to produce a positive response, but didn't come from semen, but came from the woman itself. Uh, however, there we have another problem because if you start searching for um, female ejaculation, information on a gray literature source such as Pornhub, you are going to find tons of videos. So you can find 30,000 videos. Assuming that each video is five minutes long, you are going to have 100, more than 100 hours of female ejaculation data. However, if you go to more classical uh, sources, you are going to find much less results. And this, I think, it's by itself shows how little importance is given to female sexual health in research in general. But this has been a long and confusing slide, so I'm going to go through some of the conclusions of these specific slides. The presence of endogenous PSA in the vagina can alter the results. Some women ejaculate during orgasm. Female ejaculate has a smaller concentration of PSA and comes in smaller volumes as well. However, it still has the potential to create false positives. Now, another thing that we should consider is how do we measure PSA? PSA techniques have changed throughout the years and they in general have become cheaper and more reliable, but the types of tests could be divided into three groups again, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative. These types of tests follow more or less the same properties than categorical, ordinal, and integer variables. Uh, so the qualitative is usually going to be binary, yes or no. The semi-quantitative is going to provide like a some form of scale, but it's not an integer scale. And the quantitative one, it's going to give you a specific measure, however many nanograms per milliliter of PSA. The commercial assays that are used in most research, because most research is using already existing commercial assays, are various. Uh, here are the five, the ones that are the five ones that are most commonly used in the topic in the studies that I have seen. However, I want to drive attention to the Avacard. The Avacard it's a qualitative, a binary test, and the Avacard, not this Avacard, this Avacard looks very much like the sort of test that we used to do when we were having, like when the pandemic started. So you have this control and test strip, you have to like dilute the swab in a small uh, volume of uh, dilution liquid, and then you have to put some drops here. This is a very cheap procedure. It's like you don't require a, a lab for this. You can do it everywhere. It's like less than $10 per test, per strip, I mean. Uh, so this is the thing that is becoming more and more common to use. However, since we are measuring 
PSA, and we have talked about the positivity threshold. It's also important to consider what are the positivity threshold of all of these essays. Are they the same? The fact is that they are not. Depending on the study, the specific research teams are going to use different positivity thresholds. Some of them are going to consider one nanogram per, mil per milliliter of PSA as a positive threshold. So anything above this is going to consider a is going to be considered positive. While others, such as the ones that are using Avacart, are using a much higher range. Um, threshold, which is four nanograms. Now, this is bound to create some variability because the positivity threshold is going to be different depending on the essay that you are using. Uh, and this has to do both with the commercial essay because the essay is already built, but also by the decision of the research team that is using a specific threshold or a specific essay, and that might create a variability regarding how many positives and how many negatives, and considering that there might be endogenous presence of PSA in smaller levels, depending on the threshold that is being used, you might get a lot of variability regarding positiv positivity in the essays, which is going to end up affecting how it contrasts against the self-reported measures. So yeah. And how about Y chromosomal DNA, the other biological marker that we are using? So I am not going to go deep here because Y chromosomal DNA, it's very comp it's much more complex than I can understand. I can tell you that it uses PCR, polymerase, P polymerase chase reaction, which allows for the artificial replication of specific genes. It usually targets these two genes, which are supposed to only be found in sperm. And this means, uh, I'm sorry, this is important because the reliability is tightly related to the specific amplification procedure that are, they are using in their essay. And the sort of information here, it's too complex. I don't really understand exactly the procedure because they are much more, they require a, a, large, a larger biological background than I have, a stronger biological background than I currently have, sorry. But one of the things that it's important regarding Y chromosomal DNA is that there is a possibility that non-semen sources of Y chromosomal DNA could be found in a woman's vagina because all body surfaces are covered with epithelial cells and a vagina might be exposed to Y chromosomal DNA from epithelial cells during sex acts that do not require a condom. In other words, digital or oral sex. However, there are some studies that have found that the concentration of Y chromosomal DNA varies depending on the specific uh, sexual act that is being carried. And for vaginal sex, the one that we are interested, the rates are orders of magnitude higher than those of receptive oral sex and digital sex. In other words, uh, we shouldn't really be worried about the possibility of the confounding factor that other forms of sex that are not vaginal sex might have on the positivity of Y chromosomal DNA research. Uh, and also the specific procedure that they are using apparently can allow researchers to remove all Y chromosomal DNA that is not related to the two genes that I mentioned, the ones that are found in sperm. So that's easier to find. So Y chromosomal DNAs can be found in other, in other tissues involved in the sexual encounter, but their concentration is smaller than in vaginal sex. And the current extraction methods eliminate Y chromosomal DNA from non-semen sources, which seems to indicate that Y chromosomal DNA might be a better biological indicator than PSA. But this is still debated. I told you I was going to use this twice. Now, regarding false negatives, again, we have some preliminary concepts that we need to discuss. The first one is the detection window. This is the period of time in which a biomarker can be measured. There has been an agreed number, I'm sorry, an agreed length of the detection window. For example, the PSA is 48 hours and Y chromosomal DNA is 14 days, as I mentioned before. And the other concept that is important to remember is rate of decay. The rate of decay is the rate at which a biomarker becomes undetectable by the assay. And like the presence or the nature of the biomarker has disappeared and is not easy to be, to be picked up by an assay. Now, this means the detection window and the rate of decay, this means that ideally our probabilities of detecting 
uh, semen in a vagina are going to follow this distribution. It's going to be probably close, I mean, ideally, it's going to be close to 100% up to the 48 hour mark for PSA. And then it's going to start declining until it becomes uh, unrecognizable. And in the case of Y chromosomal DNA, we're going to follow the same distribution, but it's going to last for 14 days. So it's like a long graph, uh, but it's going to end up following the same thing, right? But for a longer period. That is, however, what would be ideal, but we know that reality is not ideal and reality is real. So what we have is that the rate of decay follows this distribution. This is the predict these are the predicted probabilities of detecting 1000 microliters of semen uh, by biomarker. This is a study that was conducted uh, to try to rate if these are reliable and how reliable were these at different detection periods. And as you can probably see, for the case of PSA, the denaturation of the protein starts much earlier than the 48 hours that we were hoping for. In fact, after 24 hours, the odds of, of picking up the, of registering the PSA results as positive go down to 20%. And 48 hours is close to like six, 6%, 6 something like that. So we might be getting more false negatives because of this, because we are expecting that the biomarker is going to be reliable up until here, up until these 48 hours, but it actually becomes much harder to pick much before than we expect. In the case of Y chromosomal DNA, the distribution follows a slightly similar pattern, especially at the later stages. So after 12 hours, it follows the same, the same decline. However, it is not as sharp as the one from PSA, and it also, you can keep it longer in time. One thing that it's important is that this study worked with a thousand microliters of semen. Uh, however, the average ejaculation is larger than this, is three times larger. So in reality, the probabilities might be higher for an average uh, sexual encounter in which uh, an average ejaculation is going to occur. However, we also have to be mindful that the variability of the of uh, the volume of ejaculation varies. It's like, it's very big. So you can have large ejaculation, small ejaculations, depending on the person and the state and whatever. But also um, that not all sexual encounters end up in ejaculation. So there could be a sexual encounter that involves uh, a vaginal sexual encounter that is does not involve, involve male ejaculation. That is also important to consider. Uh, so finally, the, to conclude in this part, the detection window and the rate of decay um, PSA test failed to identify semen exposure way before the 48 hours limit. There are very strong risk of false negative of PSA results after 24 hours. Y chromosomal DNA suffers a similar yet weaker decrease in accuracy. And this implies that essays are frequently failing to capture semen exposure in the selected time frame. So that means that we might be getting more false positives than we expected. Uh, now. I have given you a bunch of information and I'm sorry, I know it's kind of different to the things that we usually discuss in survey research. So in order to wrap it up, let's try to conclude. The first thing that I want to say is that I am not a crazy person. I did not go into all this detail out of nothing. The information that we can find here regarding the reliability of different biological markers and self-reported measures, it's important because a lot of what we do is based on self-reported measures. Uh, so that might have an effect on the sort of theories that we can create as well as policies, budgets, and stuff like that. So let's go to, okay, the actual conclusions of this uh, presentation. Biomarkers hold very little correlation with self-reported measures of condom use. The percentage of discordant reports differs widely depending on the study, population, biomarkers, and other factors. Nevertheless, the trend is clearly set in the overreporting of condom use. However, biomarkers are not flawless. They are not the gold standard at all. I like to see them as an electrum standard, basically a mixture of gold and silver, all in a better way, another point in your data triangulation triangle compared to the self-reported one, of course. 
Now, to understand their strengths and weaknesses, one needs to go deep into the topic. Um, just like a small thing, PSA can strongly be affected by endogenous PSA production in women and uh, by variations of the threshold of positivity, which are linked to the instrument that is, be that is being used, among other things. Still, the use of biomarkers appeals to fall on the conservative side, especially considering that the essay's capacity to register a positive result is going to rapidly fall um, after semen exposure much before the 48 hours or the 15 days that are used as the detection windows in the studies. This implies that false negatives can be much more common than false positives. And this implies that the real discourses, the discordance might be even higher. And some final thoughts, and this is my last, sli my last slides. What other variables can be affected by, rep by reporting bias? Okay, we know penis size, that's a given. How about number of sexual partners, partner attractiveness, retrospective pregnancy desire, which is a very common question in DHS. And how about if we go beyond sexual behavior research? How about height or weight, occupation, income, health, well-being, migratory status, intimate partner violence, all of these could be affected by some form of self-reported bias, self bias. And how could this bias be affecting your research and what can you do to try to get more reliable, valid results? That is all I wanted to say to you today. Thank you. I have been told I need to promote myself more. So you can find me on this Twitter account or if you want to send me an email, you can find me at this email address. These are some of the, these are the results, the, sorry, these are the studies that I included finally in the reference, I'm sorry, as a reference in the, in the systematic review. And these are some additional uh, information that I used uh, throughout the presentation. So thank you all. Uh, that would be all for me. Thank you very much, Ignacio. That was fascinating. Uh, we've already got uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A. I've got a couple of my own as well, but I'm going to start with uh, one from Kath. It's quite lengthy, so I'll just try and uh, paraphrase. So this is about the, the inconsistency between this self-reported condom use and the biomarker. Doesn't it depend on when the condom is used slash applied. So for instance, if a condom is used or applied after sex begins, then there may already have been some semen exposure, therefore no inconsistency. Any thoughts on that one? Yes, uh, that is a common concern and I understand it. That is why it's so important to make sure that the self-reported aspect of the contrasting uh, questions is properly conducted. So I don't know if you remember that I mentioned that the, the, the way in which the questions are phrased in this sort of studies is very specific. So they ask for those who used a condom all the time. I'm sorry, they ask, when did you put the condom? Did you take it out at some point in time? Did you do anything before? Stuff like that. And the results that I presented in both reliability A and reliability B are the ones that are either reported 100% condom use, which means that they used the, uh, that if they had sex, they used condoms 100% of the time, or they had abstinence, or they reported abstinence, basically. Uh, so yes, it is very important to make sure that the, the way in which we phrase the question is detailed. But in these sort of studies, it, they are very concerned about that specific topic. So they are asking very specific questions. And the sort of response that we get uh, regarding the reliability is selected to only that subset of participants who either reported 100% condom use or total abstinence. OK, thanks. Um, as actually, I'm going to go back to another section of Kath's contribution because it follows up directly on that. So she says, as not all studies are able to include biomarkers, so have to rely on self-reported data on condom use, and that studies are often very limited in terms of question space, which one question do you think is the most reliable question to ask to best capture condom use? You've only got one item. 
Oh, thank you. That's a very interesting question. And that is a very hard question. Uh, and I think it's going to probably depend on what are the objectives of the study that you're conducting. There are several ways in which this question has been phrased and they all possess positive and negative aspects. Uh, so for example, one of the most common ones is, did you like what, the last time you had sex, did you use a condom or not? Because it's easier to remember the last time you had sex because it's most recent in your mind. Uh, and that's the one that I've seen that is most commonly used. However, depending on the way, depending on the objectives of your data collection, you might want to use another one. So uh, the percentage of, I'm sorry, the, um, the number of times that you use uh, a condom over the number of times you had sex, or you might even be wondering like, why did you use a condom the last time you had sex? Or you might ask if you want to be more specific, you can ask what type of condom did you use? Like that's the, the variability of the question is going to produce different results, but that one is, that is going to be related to the, the objectives of your study. So I don't think I can say that there is one that is the, the, the best. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, more of a comment, really, from uh, Aurelia. Uh, it says her research uses the indirect elicitation method, uh, e.g. list experiment, to measure condom use among female sex workers in Africa and uh, confirms that there is also huge misreporting here and just makes the comment that it is indeed good to be able to compare indirect elicitation methods with biomarkers. So it's a Vote of confidence for your for your presentation. Yeah, I mean, run. I think they are. I mean, depends on where what discipline you come from. If they have different names, I know them more like random list experiments, but I think they are the same. And yes, they are a different way in which we can ask for difficult question, difficult to answer questions, especially regarding um, social desirability questions and particularly those that are related to shame or, or embarrassment, like, uh, for example, things that uh, like intimate, intimate partner violence, I know that they are thoroughly discussed in using those sorts of methods. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, next question is from uh, Francisca. Uh, do you have examples of the context of these studies where the biological samples and self-reports are captured? Do participants answer a question in a questionnaire in private. I was wondering this myself. Um, do all women participants accept the vaginal swab or just a subset of the participants? I do not know. I mean, in order to be included in the study, they have to accept the two. They have to accept the self-reported and they have to accept the vaginal swab. So the final sample only includes the, the ones that have the two of them. There might be some attrition before that, some people that might have uh, not be aware or not understand completely, and then they say no, but those are not usually included in the final sample. Uh, so I think they are supposed to accept the two of them and they should understand, I mean, if the informed consent is being done properly, uh, they should be aware of all of these before the first step of the research starts. And regarding the context, it varies, cons it varies considerably because in some cases you have like interventions that are like related to health clinics, for example, uh, on existing pro health programs. So for example, one of them is has to do with more than one has to do with PrEP distribution, pre-exposure prophylaxis distribution, um, and others are related to interventions to try to increase the, to improve the health of female sex workers, for example, and they are providing condoms or stuff like that. Um, so, th and that's one of the important things that I that I try to mention is like the fact that the the fact that they are in an intervention context uh, might drive the social desirability higher. So they might be they might feel forced to misreport because they don't want to be seen as if they are not taking advantage of the intervention. Uh, and that's one of the most important topics. Uh, but that on, not only affects intervention, the intervention context, it can also affect the, the natural context because we are always affected by social desirability in one way or another. So yeah, thank you for the question, Francisca. Yeah, it certainly occurred to me that in terms of people coming forward to to take part in these kind of things. We know that there are some people who are a bit 
uh, wary of you know spending 45 minutes 60 minutes answering questions about society and politics and this is a much more intrusive threshold uh, for participation so we would assume um, you know a, a non-representative sort of audience let's push on with other people's questions a uh, question from Steph uh, says really enjoyed the presentation thanks uh, you've already just touched on this, I think. The female sex workers often complain about clients taking off condom during intercourse, and there may be other aspects that lead to non-condom use, uh, which are unknown to a female partner. Can you comment on that informational potential source of the gap between self-reports and biomarkers? That is a very interesting question. Uh, to be honest, I did not consider the possibility that stealthing might drive the discordance higher, but you are correct. That might be uh, one of the confounding factors or one of the factors that it that are going to influence a higher uh, discordance reports regarding the, I'm sorry, a higher discordance, discordance between the report and the biological marker of semen exposure, especially because there are several studies that show that um, in the case of sexual workers, they might be forced or highly encouraged uh, by their, um, oh God, I don't know how to say it, pro uh, pimps basically, to not use condoms during their activities because clients are willing to pay more for that. Uh, so they get an economical benefit. So yes, that is indeed a very interesting question. And I think, uh, uh, a topic, a way of addressing it that I have not even considered. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question from Anna. Wanted to ask if you thought of any ways that we can test this reliability, since we can't really know what is accurate and what not. Maybe uh, combining different methods of testing, open brackets, into method, into rater, test, retest. I think that is the best way of addressing it because like no, we are never going to find the perfect method. And there's always going to be either too expensive or too time consuming or too difficult to implement. Uh, so what we need to do is get variability. Like we get more methods and by getting more methods, our data triangulation triangle, it's going to become more and more accurate. Uh, one of the things that I always try to come up is to come up with is different ways in which we can measure something so that we don't rely only on self-reported measures, which is, I think, one of the main failings of a lot of surveys, because we end up constructing all our knowledge in just self-reports instead of including self-reports as part of a larger uh, way of information, I'm sorry, a larger network of different data points in which we are going to triangulate the actual truth. So that's basically what uh, one of the, my, the, the main goals of this is to try to come up with more ideas, more ways in which we can measure it. Thank you. Uh, Shalini asks, what is the source of the graph you showed where you showed the ideal situation for the detection window and the rate of decay of PSA and YCDNA? Ah, uh, yes, that, give me one second. I think I can show you. The, this one, the ideally I, I made it, <laughs> but this one is based on Hamshidi et al. If, um, if I don't have the reference like in my mind, but if you send me an email, I can send you the reference. And I, because it, it's a very interesting study because they measure different different quantities of um, of semen to, to try to test if different quantities are going to be picked up by different like differently depending on the time window in which they are testing it's a fascinating study okay thank you, you can do that by correspondence uh, alina says such issues that are affected by social desirability bias wouldn't it be better to look at indirect measures rather than ask self reported questions so, for instance, suggests to look at annual sales of condoms in that country and compare the trend on a yearly basis, for instance. Any thoughts on that? So sort of contextual data, macro data, if you will. They have been used. I know that they are one of the sources that they are used. And they are good at, a, I mean, they can be good at a larger level, but we also only have like, you have only national data or like best case scenario, you only have like regional data or maybe local data, but you don't know per person, per event, 
what is, if, if that is related to a specific intervention or if that is related to a, speci to a specific age or social economic bracket. So yes, uh, as usual, I think we should get more data points, more ways of collecting that information. Uh, and I know that one has been tested. And I know a lot of people don't really like it because it's too generic and there are too many things that are going to have an effect, uh, including market influences. So if something goes cheaper or on sale, you are going to find a lot of people that are stocking up either condoms or whatever, uh, and that is going to create a um, distortion in your sales uh, figures. Uh, so yeah, they can be used, but they are not perfect. They are just another tool that we can use. An interesting question from Mike uh, asks, do you tend to get better correlations if the biometric measurement is stronger? Uh, do you mean if the quality of the, do you think they mean that if the quality of the measure is stronger? Is that what they? Well, I was wondering if it related in some way to these very to these uh, where people are in relation to thresholds. Oh, Ooh. I to be honest, I am not completely sure because most of the studies only work with the forty-eight or fourteen day, forty-eight hours or fourteen days um, window. So there are very few studies that have, I mean, quite frankly, I cannot recall even one study that did like, okay, 24 hours, mm -hmm. um, which would be an interesting metric. And quite frankly, it's probably not that difficult to reconstruct if we have access to the databases that they could do. So yeah, that would be an interesting meta-analysis to, to conduct. Okay. And staying sort of in the region of that theme, one of the things that was on my mind was, of course, one of the things we've tried to do to close the gap in um, the variability of survey methods is, is harmonization, to always try and do things in, in the same way between studies. And you, you present for us in your, your sort of systematic review sort of a great deal of variety in terms of sort of thresholds and et cetera, et cetera. Did you come across any sense in that literature that there might be a convergence towards use of particular tests or uh, length of detection windows or thresholds for positives? The length of detection window, that has been kind of like set in stone for some reason in the 48 hours, 15 days. Uh, that one, I am not positive how they reached it, but that's the one that they reached and they all use the same. That one is, is done. But the others, the positivity threshold, the, I think that is driven more by commercial and economic reasons. And that is related to the ABA card because now ABA card is so cheap and it's so easy to implement that you can do it in the field. Like that, I mean, I think there are a couple of studies in which the same person, I'm sorry, the, the respondent is doing the test themselves or at least doing the swap and sending the, the specific, um, you know, the the swap in a, in a small tube. Um, so I think that is the thing that is driven more, that is driving most of the homogeneous, homogenization. The fact that most people, most researchers are going to end up using the cheapest method or the most convenient method. And that convenient method, since it's a categorical method, that means that it has a set uh, yes or no binary position, it's going to end up creating, I think, a more homogeneous, uh, landscape in the research, but that's not going to be driven by the research search researchers themselves, but by the tool that they are using. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, getting your way through such a large number of questions. That talk stimulated a great deal of interest among our audience. So we'll leave it there. We're almost coming up to two o'clock. Uh, thank you very much, Ignacio, for that talk. Uh, thank you to everyone who's logged on. Uh, you'll be able to uh, see this talk on our YouTube channel in due course uh, if you've missed part or all of it. Uh, just to sign off by saying that our next webinar will be on the 1st of May when we'll be looking at UNICEF's multiple indicator cluster surveys. Uh, but until then, and for the time being, from everyone at uh, European Social Survey, uh, it's goodbye.